Um, all right. Well, uh, I suppose let's go on and, and jump in and get started then. Um, so this, uh, like I was saying a minute ago, the chapters here at the beginning seem fairly short. And um, I am not sure exactly how meaty they will turn out to be, but I thought it might be an opportunity to use this first chapter to kind of continue some of the getting to know you stuff that we were doing last week, since it deals with uh, roles, uh, data roles in education and then process. Um, and so I thought we might talk about what our, you know, um, most typical roles and activities are, and then whether the process that was outlined um, kind of resonates with the process you guys use, um, that sort of thing. Um, so that's that's uh, kind of generally where I thought I would take this. And of course we can um, then toward the end, you know, just jump off of any points that jumped at you guys as, uh, as interesting. Uh, I will share my screen here. Um, and so can you guys see my PowerPoint now? All right, so um, this is the uh, th this is just kind of the outline structure of the first section of the chapter, which was data roles in education. Um, so I thought I, I would just do one slide on kind of um, like restating what those were, and then do a little poll on what your most typical roles are um, from among those. So it. Uh, They've divided this up into um, building systems that get data to the right people. So that would involve like warehousing data and also um, kind of governance issues, uh, deciding not only who does need to get the right data, but also security issues about who shouldn't have access to it and then designing it, you know, in different ways um, for use by say administrators or teachers or whoever the uh, relevant audiences. Um, so their second role is measuring impact on student experience. Um, third is looking for patterns in student data. Uh, and maybe I'm thinking about this a little too temporally, but I kind of thought looking for patterns seemed a little more, I might've switched the middle two there. Um, looking for patterns seemed a little bit more open-ended and then measuring impact um, kind of a little more concrete. Uh, but looking for patterns would be something more like exploratory data analysis and uh, hypothesis generation. Uh, and then the last uh, category they have is um, improving how we use statistical models in education. So that would be um, like the model development itself or kind of a level stepped, um, step back from the day-to-day -day, uh, work that some of the other categories talk about where it's uh, like refining processes more generally. So um, to kick things off, I thought we could go to this uh, poll that I set up in Poll Everywhere. Um, so you can go to that, uh, that URL. And it's just going to ask you which of the steps of the, or which of the roles you find yourself occupying most often. And let me see, maybe it would help if I would put that in the chat also. I suppose you guys can see that uh, on your screens as well, but there are the results we're getting. Has everybody managed to log in or managed to register your results? So 
Looks like we've got um, the majority of people are in two categories here, um, building systems that get data to the right people and looking for patterns in student data. Uh, we've got one person measuring impact and one person, or and nobody looking for um, how to improve the models we use. So maybe those folks aren't signing up for, um, for the, uh, the reading groups. <laughs> there. Heads are in their, their models, I suppose. Um, so I, uh, I thought we might just talk a little bit then about kind of why you put yourself in each category and you people can talk a bit about what sort of work they do that fits in those categories. Um, I will, uh oh, it's changing um, even as we speak. So we've got uh, a slight lead now for people looking for patterns in student data. Um, uh, all right, so I'll, I'll start and say that I had a little trouble because as I said last week, I'm not um, day to day, have not been doing uh, this, this sort of work and I'm kind of just getting into the um, field myself but uh, I work as an instructional designer and the project that I'm working on right now um, as I move into this field involves uh, our organic chemistry class at UNC and a data set that uh, we're just in the process of generating based on student clicks um, and log data within our Sakai learning management system and trying to build, um, I guess eventually build a model that uh, predicts their, um, their final exam scores uh, in organic chemistry so that we can get help to people earlier in the semester who need it. Um, but at this point, I just have a big mess of, um, of logs um, for who's clicking on which resource and I'm trying to make some sense of it and try to figure out what the patterns, um, what the patterns are and which, you know, which of what, you know, which of the uh, resources can be grouped together, uh, which ones are the most predictive and that kind of thing. So uh, I said looking for patterns in student data, at least that's where I feel like I'm at right now. Um, how about other folks? I think for me, it kind of changes, but like right now it's getting the right, getting data to the right people. So sometimes my department gets requests so recently we got a request of like, well, we wanna give more funding for, for the CARES Act for other students. So they ask us of what students are eligible to receive funding and can you provide us a list of those students? Or another might be, um, can you tell us, you know, what's the FTE for every program area? And so like right now, again, it depends, but that's what I feel like most of my work is, is, you know, accessing the database, bringing it into R, transforming it and then passing it on to whoever to whoever requested the data and then sometimes you know we get pattern looking but again it just depends sometimes it's going to be a lot of requests and it's just getting the data to the people and for them to use it and remind me where uh where you are what kind of institution you guys work in i guess as you um as you begin talking maybe give us a, a little you know reminder of your background because I remember I think I remember that you're in the Pacific Northwest yeah but... so I'm in, I'm in eastern Washington I work for a community college mm -hmm. uh, in the institutional research department okay I'll go next um, I also work in institutional research department so I do a lot of reports like that too where it's just like student lists and stuff um, I chose um, uh, what did I choose? The pattern one as well, because I think in the text it said something about like looking at trends across different subgroups or student subgroups. And so a lot of the requests, like one current one is like they want to look at retention and graduation rates in our, um, our university students and how that breaks up upon like different subgroups of so eligibility or um, I don't know, there's URM uh, underrepresented minorities. And so just kind of what are they looking at in different subgroups of it? So um, a lot of that is also report, like kind of just getting it to the right people, but it's like kind of looking at patterns. We're not the ones like making decisions, but I guess it's just trying to like highlight those differences for those people, for the people that are making the decisions. So it's interesting that the two of you, even though you're both in institutional research, put your activity in different categories. It sounds like you are also sometimes getting data to people, um, but uh, maybe falls on a different side of the line. And what I'm doing, they're calling institutional research, even though that's not the department I work in. I'm different than, than either of those. 
Uh, how about others? I go next. Um, I'm Martin Cotel. I actually missed the first meeting because I had a work meeting. I also didn't sync my calendar, so that was my fault. Um, I'm in Seattle. I work for a research evaluation and consulting group that works with uh, school districts and state agencies. And so I was, I think, the only one that did measuring impact for work on student experience. Um, right now, I'm in the midst of writing a pair of reports on two evaluation projects, so that's where my mind's at. But as I read through this, it, it really bleeds a lot into looking for patterns in student data, especially because we have some statewide projects where you know I'm running through data sets for thousands of students across the state based on you know an intervention or a class. And so um, there's a lot of big picture stuff there too. So I'm, you know, between those two. What sort of interventions? The, like one I'm working on right now is a double blocked math class for students who did not pass their eighth grade state test and to see, and it's, it's double blocked. And then um, the curriculum itself is out of the University of Texas. It's based on um, like basically work ethic and um, trying to make it a cooperative learning environment and so the kids are in a totally different algebra class than the rest of the students and so we have like a matched group of different schools around the state that i'm comparing the data to do now we're on year i want to say four so i have four years of those you know that first group is kids of students so it's a pretty wide-ranging project all right it works by the way is that dave yeager's project it's no it's the agile mind project out of university oh. I can go. Mark Lavania, I'm at Ed Reports. We're a nonprofit review K-12 curriculum, standards alignment. Um, a big part of my work is measuring impact of the organization. And we really, students are not the, uh, the, the primary audience, really districts, like whether they adopt certain programs and so forth. So I didn't pick B because I'd say measuring impact on districts would really be. Um, the work that I focus on, but I picked A because this is really what a challenge I'm facing. I'm trying to build a database on what curricula are being used by districts and schools across the country. Um, and we have some decent survey data and so forth that I can pull in for triangulation, but also using the uh, this gov spend database, which is um, procurement data, line items out of purchase orders. Um, and it's just really messy and um, having a good time figuring out how to make good sense of that and bringing that all together um, and, and validate those data against other, you know, sources of like what it says in the district website and so forth. So bringing, bringing a lot of skills to bear from web scraping to a lot of cleaning and um, uh, that's not my background. <laughs> my background is more sort of research design, straightforward data modeling, structural page modeling. So um, that that's where I'm growing in ours, which is why I picked that. I think Morgan just um, popped in here. So let me just mention again that what we're doing right now is we've uh, we've taken a little poll on poll everywhere to identify which of the roles we most identify with. So uh, you could be looking at those roles from the chapter and, and thinking about which one you identify with. Uh, feel free to answer the poll if you'd like. Um, and then we've just been going around and talking about how our work fits into them. Uh, I will leave it there on the chart for another minute or something and come back. But uh, who haven't we heard from? Um, so, a lot of what everyone has said is like similar, which is both uh, like uh, heartening, but also disheartening. Like we're just all struggling with very similar things. Um, uh, and so I, I, so I'm Ryan. I work at the Institute for Educational Initiatives at Notre Dame, um, where we do, where we do the team that I work on is program evaluation of. Um, the 12 to 15 different programs we have running. Um, and most of them are at like trying to impact a, a teacher or a school leader. Um, we don't really have any direct um, intervention with the students. And so there's a lot of impact that we're trying to measure, but um, yeah, I, I picked one because um, I've helped with people thinking through their research design, making sure that there's a clear data flow from the question that they're asking 
to the answer that they are trying to get. Um, and so I, I, I helped think through some of those systems um, and we're, we're trying to, a lot, a lot of it's like patchwork uh, that we do program by program, but we're trying to build a overarching system that would be able to say, okay, this is what the organization is doing um, overall, because we can't, we don't say anything like that. We've been around for 25 years and we don't have any sort of like quick thing to say. And so we're, we're trying to work through that. So it's definitely a, you know, building the systems right now. All right, anybody else uh, want to chime in? Yeah, sorry, I joined late. It's, uh, it's a little crazy for me. I'm in the, the snowy weather without shut oh. everything down. So, <laughs> um, but for me, so I'm a retention specialist. Um, and so uh, a lot of my work is looking for student patterns, um, but also um, measuring the impact of initiatives on persistence of, of our students. And, um, you know, obviously with the goal of seeing what works and what doesn't and uh, outreach to students that are at risk um, to help them obtain the degree that they came to higher ed for. Thanks. Um, and Marina said she was going to skip this question. Uh, Daniel, are you? Do you have anything to add here? All right, I'll let Daniel just uh, pipe in if he'd like to. So did you guys find this easy to classify yourself? Or did you find yourself falling between categories or doing something that wasn't represented in this uh, typology at all? How did you feel about them? I, I think there was a couple of us that were like addressing a different level within education and not just students. Um, and so I, I, that's, I was, I'm actually really curious as to why they didn't do some sort of, um, you know, like teacher education related thing or, or even reference that uh, somewhere, at least in this section. I understand that education's main goal is to get students to learn and grow and stuff. Um, but it seems as though a lot, of, a lot of the work, at least that we're doing, some of the work that we're doing relates to the larger levels of education. Do those come back to student, um, student outcomes at some point or, or in a logic model or something? Could, can they be connected? You're just not. Ideally, right. But, um, you know, working with Catholic schools, we don't have the same systems that public schools do. And so, and like Catholic schools take a different tests across, even within diocese and, uh, or no tests at all. And, uh, uh, and so their, their database is not, yeah, the national database is either non-existent or only includes very limited like, demographic type yeah. and enrollment numbers. Um, and so, yeah, that was, that was my question is like, how do you do that? I'm, I just don't know the public ed space as well. Um, and the Catholic ed space is years behind. So I'm, yeah, I, I ideally we do, we do mm -hmm. want to get student impact, but we just can't yet. Pretty hard to make that full link. I was briefly part of a, uh, a research project in grad school where they were trying to collect data from the teacher pipeline all the way through to their student results. And it was a decade ago, probably um, not, not quite, but it kept getting pushed back and getting um, extensions. And I don't know that they were ever really able to demonstrate that link. Pretty complicated. Anybody else notice that they were interested in things other than student data or, or student learning or experience? Yeah. 
in my office, we also look at faculty data. It's a university setting. So um, a lot of our analyses are like student centric, but then we also have like faculty salary equity analyses and stuff like that. So um, there's like different requests coming from different levels of administration. Um, but it's never really like tying it back to the student. It's like kind of separate silos, I guess. Yeah, and like, like I alluded to, um, a big part of our work is supporting districts to adopt aligned curricula. So um, the outcome of interest is really um, the, the uptake of, of high quality instructional materials, which is typically at a district level. Mm -hmm. um, slightly related to that, back when I did work in education, some things that we looked at that weren't specifically student re related, but definitely connected was um, teacher value added. Um, so, you know, the, as you were just saying, the, the impact that a specific teacher might have on student outcomes and also relatedly textbooks. So we did tackle the question of are certain textbooks leading to better uh, student outcomes in, I think, math and English language learning. Yeah, I was, so I was thinking somebody, nobody has mentioned kind of economic data or like workforce related things, but it seems like that might be another, you know, direction that people might, uh, people might go. I was listening. So last week, somebody mentioned a recent episode of the education data podcast that was about Kentucky. Um, we had a, a member of the group who's not here today, who's part of the Kentucky project. Um, and it, it was fairly student centered in terms of um, like measuring student outcomes and connecting them to their uh, kindergarten scores or something like that. And, and they were like workforce data, but I think you could also imagine something that would be interested in, you know, economic um, outcomes. And I know that at UNC, this isn't really related to any data work that I would do, but I mean, certainly a lot of, um, a lot of considerations are driven not um, not just by uh, student outcomes, but I mean, there's a lot of balancing of everybody's interests, including faculty interests, but also you know maybe research output or something like that. Um, so certainly an educational institution, but you could imagine I guess that might be academic analytics or something, but they probably uh, overlap a fair amount or not. Okay. They, <laughs> overlap within organizations, but go in different directions. I wonder why they, uh, why they chose to focus on learning data. I mean, I understand that, um, and having been a teacher myself and spent a fair amount of time in that teacher and teacher education world, there's a lot of pressure to define everything that you're doing to come back to student learning. Um, and, you know, I've noticed because there are so many other pressures, it's sometimes important to push people to, to talk about how they're you know, their interventions are ultimately tied to that goal. Uh, any other thoughts on, on the roles section of this? Oh, I also thought maybe that there was an activity that wasn't really discussed that might involve cultivating new sources of data or something like that. Um, just another note that I'd made for myself that I didn't think really fit in. Um, okay, I will move on then to the second section, which was about defining the process of data science. Um, and I will share my screen again here briefly. Um, so uh, the, the chapter began by listing these six steps that you see at the left that are coming from, um, from Wickham and Groland. Um, so a, a six-step process, uh, importing, tidying, transforming, visualizing, modeling, and then communicating. And as they note, um, Wickham and Groland, when they visualize that, the middle sections there are in a sort of a cyclical relation to each other. Um, 
And then they go ahead, they sort of say that they're going to adopt this model, but then when they describe it themselves, the terms change a little bit. Um, and uh, so they kind of group all of those into three categories, processing, analysis, and sharing results. Uh, I think that there is a, a cyclical element to those two. I just didn't um, have space to really represent that there. And then they referenced um, they referenced another model uh, from Peng and Matsui that has fairly similar uh, similar categories, but I don't know they're configured a little bit differently. So stating the question, exploratory data analysis, um, model building. So there's less, I feel like there's less preparation. There's a collecting um, input stage here, but there seems to be maybe kind of less, less tidying and uh, reshaping and such. Uh, model building, interpretation, and then communication. And they are, are all visualized as uh, interacting with each other as part of this like cog graphic. Um, so which of, um, which of these models resonates for you? Do they, feel like your process? Do you do things that, uh, I don't know, that don't conform neatly to the models? And I see we've also got a little chat in the, um, in the chat about data curation. Um, so finding data that teams need to answer a question. Uh, okay, I was looking back to see who had um, introduced that. So that was Mark. All right. So how do you guys feel about the the stages here? I feel like that um, Wickham and Groleman thing. I see that showing up a fair amount. So it seems like maybe that's catching on as the um, kind of canonical way of representing it. But I don't know if it if it conforms to your like messy real world data analysis. Yeah, there's, um, so I mean, I'm, I'm familiar with this one from, um, from R for Data Science, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I was most familiar with. And then I feel like a lot of them cover many of the same topics, right? Um, but one thing that I've enjoyed in one of the models that I've been taught is including the idea of ethical considerations, like mm -hmm. throughout, um each of the steps and the steps are again relatively uh, synonymous um uh just drawn out visually different um but i've really enjoyed the idea of um emphasizing the the ethical considerations and the storytelling aspects and not just the technical pieces of of what is included um in the in the analysis, modeling, visualization pieces, but really thinking through who is it for and why are you doing it? Mm -hmm. I like the processes <clears throat> laid out, but there's, there's some part of my work that's maybe not totally represented there. There's a good portion where I'm reactive, like team members contact me, say, hey, can you help me with getting some data on this or, or an answer on that? Um, and then there's also a part where it's, um, it's, it's I'll, I, I'll receive, we have partnerships with organizations do big survey data and I'll have this, some data and it's like, there's some cool information here that I have to present to my team as like a problem of practice. Like, hey, we have some data on this. It could, you know, it, you know is this something we would want to explore and, and, and produce into some sort of social media um, uh, collateral or can it inform some of our work internally and so forth. So um, it, that's maybe more of a, both of those are kind of purpose directions that maybe sort of intersect with that model. Um, but I, I just thought that would I'd raise that. Can you say a little bit more about what you mean by reactions um, or like reactive to? Sure. Um, so this might be a very narrow example, but so we review curriculum and so we have to decide what what are we going to review and a large large part of what drives it is sort of market share like what's the usability on something so 
we'll get contact us requests for website. Hey, can you review this? We're always like figuring out what to focus on and they'll, my then the con curriculum um, content teams will come to me and say, Hey, what do we know about usage across the country in this particular program? Right? So that's me kind of being reactive. Like, you know, um, they, they have a, they have a, they need an answer on something. And so I'll go to my data sources and try and give them an answer where the proactive is just more of like, I, I'm exploring some data that we have. And I'm like, I think there's something here we might be able to use, answer a question. Cause I'm not meeting regularly with our, with all across the organization. So I don't, they might have pro, um, initiatives that I'm not aware of. So then it's kind of more of a problem of practice of like, I have this cool stuff. Can we look at can we, something we can do with this? Oh, welcome. <laughs> So actually just to go off on that, I feel like there's also like a meta um, cleaning and tithing and importing that gets done at the start of a process to determine whether the data that you have is right or whether there's something wrong with it. And if there is, you it's not enough to just go back to the person that got it to you and say, there's something wrong with it. There's some investigation that needs to happen on your end to say, here's what I think looks weird and here's what I think might have happened. So like even before you import the data for analysis, there's like, I don't know, it's like a pre-analysis analysis of the data. That's a good point. I think for myself, when like either looking at either of those models from the book or, you know, uh, the other one, I think I spend a lot of my time in the front half of when it comes to like importing and tidying and transforming data. And then sometimes, you know, I cross over to like the visualizing or the modeling kind of aspect of it. But I feel like most of the time because of the nature of the work, it's, you know, get this data for me and then provide it to them. And then sometimes, you know, there's always annual reports, whether for those state agencies, federal agencies or internal ones that you then have to, you know, create a document and you know provide that but that's routinely that's maybe in every an annual or quarterly but I think for me especially a lot of it's going to be in the front half ideally I would like to do some of the more of the modeling kind of aspects of it but then you know that's that's the nature of the work but I think I think it's just I think it does depend on you know the flavor of the week you can yeah. say yeah, I feel like that's part of the argument of these graphics is to emphasize that it's not just modeling, right? I think that's kind of one of the purposes they serve is to emphasize the tidying and transforming. Do you guys, where the, where the model doesn't conform exactly to what you do, does it feel constraining to you or like a useful simplification or? Uh, an offensive generalization about what you do? <laughs> no strong opinions one way or the other. Do you guys have like, I was wondering if there are, if you have like maintenance type steps or like updating or kind of routine things along those lines of databases that you developed. Other adjacent things that I've worked on seems like a fair amount of it is making sure that the things we created in the past haven't broken. Yeah, I, I, I don't think I have any sort of like in production um, app for, for modeling. Um, but we are definitely, I've, I've been working with a couple specific programs that are, one is our oldest program and one is our youngest program. And so I'm thinking through like, okay, you want to be able to track, you know, um, participant attrition. Um, and we can hopefully build out a, a app that's everything, you, you know, descriptive, diagnostic, and predictive so that um, 
you know, you can understand what's going on, but we're just like, we're just starting square one. <laughs> um, and so there's a lot of modeling that I wish we could do, but we just, nobody's thought about it uh, for, a, for a long time. I think in terms of like the modeling aspect, I think it's just nobody, I think Ryan said it, like nobody, it's new. And I think some people are tentative in making it seem prescriptive. And I think, you know, some educators, like I'm not an educator. I mean, I did, you know, teach in grad school, but I don't have, you know, 15 years of educational, you know, background. So I don't want to step on toes saying, you know, here's this model um, that might just be, you know, the way it communicated. But I think that's, it's just something very new in the educational world that I, I just feel hesitant in engaging in it. And I think, and my second point on top of the data process, um, I've begun to really connect to databases. And I think that's, I, and then working with IT, I think a lot of this might be technical, but I also, I think, you know, working with other departments, especially the IT department of like, making sure you have the right permissions and making sure, you know, you have access and making sure your R can connect, you know, SQL databases and just different databases that I think are important to know about, not just importing like flat files, but also importing and connecting to the databases that I think learning how to communicate to the IT department what you want to do. And I think working collaboration is something that I think could have, you know, maybe highlight there or, you know, I think of no, I don't know how, if you guys do that or work with the IT department or anything of that nature. Yeah. I do a lot. Like we've had a full system upgrade to Workday and it's created a mess of data. The like historical data is not coming through. That's correct. So we're like doing a lot of testing in the IR department, in the institutional research department where IT is like normally the, that kind of should have that role. So we've been working a lot closely with that. And then a lot of the times like my lack of IT permissions or whatever is it hinders on the stuff that I have to do. Like they have to create like a Tableau data source for me to kind of link into to create the dashboards. And so if that's wrong, I don't know why it's wrong in the back end or if the join is wrong. So it, it's kind of created a mess in our in our like in our office because our roles aren't kind of blurring with IT, but also there's like a very hard line between what I'm able to do and what I'm not. So it, yeah, it's been kind of a good thing and a bad thing because it's not really quite clear in my department um, what I can actually like what I can do, I guess. Yeah, the models are all, it's not explicitly just describing one person's activity. I mean, it could be two people collaborating or something, but it does seem kind of individualistic or something, doesn't it? Um, seems like a thing where one person makes a plan and somewhat linear, it might go in some cycles, but it doesn't really, you know, map the relationships you would have to other departments. And, that kind of thing. and actually also the relationship that I would have with myself in the future. Like um, that that's one thing that um, I don't know that I did it the right way, but there was more than once when I might've run a model or like made some decisions that made sense at the time, but I also knew wouldn't necessarily make sense a year from now, but I was worried that a year from now, I wouldn't remember that. So I built in a lot of, uh things in the code that would just break just to stop future me from messing up so it's it, it's it's interesting because as you said it's linear but sometimes it's it's hard to plan for the future and how to actually properly reuse models without accidentally destroying everything yeah it's fairly short term as a model it's, it's kind of medium term i guess but it's not really dealing with like a few years or something. I feel like a lot of people seem like they're building something that lasts a little bit longer. I guess people are talking about individual reports that they might run on an annual basis, but I feel like there's a lot more long-term planning here than this might be crediting. But any other passages from the discussion? It, it, the chapter then goes into like a more detailed discussion of the different analysis steps. Is there anything that people found themselves starring or highlighting?
I thought visualization was an interesting part of it, that it shows up in multiple areas, right? It's part of their analysis step and also part of their sharing results step. And I think you could actually put it in the processing step too, um, to some degree in terms of like visualizing missing data or something like that. Um, I don't know, what do, you th what do you think are the differences between these different uses of visualizations? Which ones do you find yourselves using? Any particular visualizations that are your go-tos? We use a lot of dashboards, so it's more of the communication. And so it's like connected to live data. We create a dashboard for them and they can kind of play with it on their own. Um, and a lot of like the pre-processing kind of visual visualizations that you said are like internal kind of, we don't really share that stuff. Yeah, I use the, the pre-processing or the head of, I think Marina said, I use sometimes visualizations for like data accuracy to see if there's like inconsistencies that are like, that just seems very off. Uh, I mean, whether it be, you know, maybe I did something wrong in my, you know, code or it's just, you know, IT or something or whatever it be, you know, it gets me, I try not to go too much into the weeds on it. Sometimes I have that, you know, that pitfall, but I think, it's just a good way to start. Well, is this telling me what I should be telling me? And then from there, you know, you can go. But I think visualizations in the beginning are a good way to, you know, spot some of those errors that you, you know, you may overlook at the end, or you may get to the end and be like, well, none of this was right, and so save you some time. I know a visualization caused me to realize that we were missing a lot of uh, data and caused me to throw out a whole semester <laughs> of data because it was incomplete. So I'm definitely all for visual visualizing through all of the steps. What was the visualization? Um, I was doing a semester withdrawal requests from the students. And I graphed um, when the requests were coming in. And the very first semester that I was given started at the beginning of the semester, which seemed right. But after I looked at the subsequent fall semesters, a lot of the requests actually come before the semester starts. So it made me realize just comparing fall to fall to fall that that first fall they had started their data collection at the beginning of the fall semester, but really requests for semester withdrawal happen way, can, can happen way before the semester starts. That's interesting. And I've noticed that too, especially when it comes to like transactions for students when they sign up for courses, sometimes when they're putting in the registrar, they like input them and they're like 19 or something like that. And so it's just like your line graph is like super off and you're like, well, what's wrong with that? And it just little things like that, I think, you know, transactions of like, that doesn't make sense. Or if they pull in date on a certain day, then you wouldn't know that if you don't look at it, you know, maybe if you just pull them all. I know for like applications, you pull them every Wednesday or the, you know, do financial aid every, you know, Thursday or someday, something like that. I think, you know, it gets you understanding, you know, not what am I looking at, but also, you know, what are, how do the other departments you know, input data so you have like a more holistic picture of like understanding data from all different points. And I just wanna say those were great examples and they're also kind of like why I like longitudinal data, right? Because it gives you the opportunity to look back and say, does this make sense relative to other time periods, which isn't always the case, right? With the kinds of data that you analyze. Makes you wonder what you're missing if you don't have the other time periods compared to. How about storytelling? Anybody have a particular craft for using using visuals in your storytelling or 
talking with a real heat map enthusiast the other day. It seemed like much of her life was revolved around giving herself opportunities to make nice heat maps. I'm trying to flex into that area. Isabella actually created a package of, of for um, some GIS mapping that I um, started using, um, and we're looking at how to, you know, graphically show. Uh, so we have like a rating system: uh, a color green, orange, red for uh, aligned, partial meets expectations, partially meets doesn't meet. And so using that as a way of um, what quick what with the alignment force on um, the curriculum that districts are using. So using a GIS mapping. And I started playing around a little bit of bringing in another dimension of, of um, using the alpha um, uh, and, and ggplot to um, have it show the, the, like the demographics. So like they're using aligned plus, um, you know, is it a high minority, high poverty district and so forth. And seemed like I was trying to make the map do too much. So exploring a little bit like on how, how much you can actually um, say and maybe uh, say too much uh, where it's not even readable. So playing around with some of that. Ryan, you were, were you talking about storytelling at the beginning and ethical considerations? Uh, yeah, and I'm trying to think of, um, I, you know, I, I don't have any good examples of using visualizations for storytelling. I'm trying to get better at that. Um, I think, storytelling in general? Yeah, I think, I mean, we, one, one step that I've taken is just to use visuals more often. For some reason, our stakeholders love just loved normal number reports and tables and I was like are you are you sure uh so I've offered them some visuals and they they seem to like it um and so I'm I'm taking it one step at a time with with a few few people so <clears throat> so the last section of the chapter was about the uh the complicated path that people find into the field um which I think was partly just a vehicle for them to introduce who they were, but it certainly seems to be the case that people get into this in lots of different ways. I remember when analytics and data science were kind of ramping up maybe seven years ago or so, it seemed like everybody was coming in and all kinds of, um, you know, I don't know, non-traditional ways or, uh, and then it seems like it's professionalized a bit, but maybe the educational end of things is still uh, full of people who have, um have come in 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 different ways i don't know um i thought it was interesting that they said you know not not everybody has a phd people come in in different ways um uh for me i i have a phd and it's not that phd <laughs> so some of us uh have, have other ones uh more different different kinds of research backgrounds before coming into this but um i don't know anything strike you about circuitous paths into, into the work that you're doing now? Mine started with teaching and then like a qualitative historical research direction that I'm not really on anymore. Um, and I've got off that track and then everything in my life has been pulling me in this direction since then. So going back and trying to bone up on the statistical courses that I took a while back that were not so meaningful then that I suddenly have uses for and pulling out a lot of my old books. Um, let's, uh, yeah, let's take a look at the chat. There's some activity down there. So, um, QGIS, so tools other than um, than R, and uh, folks using Python as well. What other tools are coming into play for people besides besides R? So uh, we use like 
Qualtrics as the data collection, like for surveys, um, like almost exclusively um, for, for our evaluation surveys. And then we can pull that out pretty easily from uh, the Qualtrics R package that Julia Silby maintains. Um, and so that's, that's, I use that all the time. And I, I, well, come to think of it, I'm pretty sure I'm the only one who uses R <laughs> in my organization now that I'm thinking about it. Um, and so I like to tell people, oh, don't download the data. I'll just take care of it. And so, um, so we use that for data collection. And then uh, people have told me like, oh, why don't you use Tableau? Um, so there are a few people that are interested in that, but I, um, I, I, we have a license, but I don't use it that often. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in my experience, a lot of school districts, charter schools uh, use Tableau as well. Pretty understandable. I was surprised. I, I had been like picking up that everything seemed to be moving to Python a couple of years ago, uh, not really thinking education in particular. And then as I've kind of engaged more with the education world, it seems like there's a more vibrant R community than, than Python really, which is interesting. But who was uh, Mark? You mentioned that you're stretching into Python. What is uh, what's pulling you there? Um, I'm just trying to just because there's um, there's some things I'm trying to do with databases where um, a lot of times I'll look for a solution and the you know like Stack Overflow or whatever, and it's like use Panda or whatever you know pandas or something, and so. I keep finding like someone's like, trying to solve a problem and I'm not seeing the answer in R. Um, and um, and a little bit I've worked with Python, it does seem like a cleaner, um, more intuitive language where the, you know, the R community is amazing. So um, if there's just some places where I feel like um, combining and I, I recently watched, um, I think it was on the R, R Global um, conference uh, about combining R and Python that made a good case for for bringing that together and also SQL. So um, just the, the bringing those three together seem like something I'm, I'm gonna need to get a good handle on to really do my work. I think for us, a lot of people enjoy Tableau because of its user friendly interface and they think, you know, that's fine. Uh, I don't really enjoy it, but you know, I'll do it. But uh, I think another one that a lot of people around other community colleges in my state do is a lot of SQL. Um, we're, we're moving toward PeopleSoft and that requires, you know, querying and this and that, and, you know, a new system for in, uh, maintaining student management or, or, you know, yada, yada, yada. But I think, I think R has a lot of great capabilities when it comes to connecting databases that I think a lot, a lot of other people are like, well, I'm just gonna stick to SQL because you know, it's the common, the common standard for when it comes to clearing databases. And I think there is some hesitation when I talk to other people or even talk to, you know, colleagues who are like, well, I'm just gonna use SQL and, you know, I'm gonna use like whatever interface you use when in reality, I mean, you can use R and never write a SQL at all. Like, I can do think a SQL person would, but I don't write SQL, I understand it, but I won't write it. And I think making those connections of like, I can still communicate to somebody who sends me a SQL code and I think understanding, you know, figuring out what best tool to use for your practice, you know, I've had the idea that, you know, maybe R is good for some things, but I think integrating and learning almost like, you know, like cooking, it's like every utensil is, you know, good for something. And so I think understanding being open to like using Python or using SQL or whatever, I think R has a great thing where you can just pull it all together in one single workflow within there. And I think that's something that I do enjoy about it. Um, that I do do in my work is that I'm, I've moved from, a, you know, use Excel over here, use Access over here, use Word over there, and then R gives everything where you can just put it all one and don't ever have to leave. And I think I, you know, I do enjoy that a lot. And I think it's, you know, it's great. All right. So we're at uh, 5.59. I was trying to leave a, a three minutes for, um, Ryan, did you want to talk about whether whether we should consolidate some of the chapters or should we do that on Slack? Uh, yeah, I was I was just looking over the chapters um, as well. And 
And chapter four is shorter than chapter three, but it has some interesting things that I think could have a good discussion. So I think we'll take it to Slack um, just to confirm that. All right, so um, we will see you on Slack for discussion about whether to whether to merge a few of those. It's nice to get our bearings with some of these initial chapters, but I kind of I'm also eager to get to the, the meat of it. So um, we'll discuss that there. Thank you guys for your uh, contributions today, and I guess we'll see each other back here next week. Any closing thoughts? Thank you, Rob. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Rob. See you next week.